from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today, I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. I suppose more than any other book in the Bible, this book predicts the future, unless it's the book of Revelation. And when you read the book of Revelation, always read the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in one hand, the book of Revelation in the other, and then in front of you, the daily newspaper, and they all tie in because Daniel is a book of prophecy. But the thing that I want to talk about Daniel today is an incident that happened in his life that I think bears on what we see happening today in our world. And in this chapter that we're turning to, I won't take time to read it to you, I'll tell it to you. It's the story of Daniel already in Babylon. He'd been carried to Babylon from Jerusalem. Jerusalem had come under the judgment of God as Jeremiah had predicted. All the judgments that Jeremiah predicted, all the judgments that the prophets predicted have all come true or they're yet to come true. This is of the Babylonians. Now when this chapter opens, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Daniel had been a friend and a prophet and a prime minister for Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. But now he's in more or less been forgotten because a young man is now on the throne by the name of Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. Now Babylon at that time was the greatest empire in the world. It was the most powerful nation in the world. It was the richest nation in the world. And the Bible pictures Belshazzar, the king, as young, rich, powerful, but at the same time egotistical, self-centered. And the Bible teaches that God hates pride. And Jesus was to say years later in Matthew 23, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. If you try to tell how great you are and leave God out, or if you act as though you can solve your own problems and arrange your own life without the help of God, God says, I'm going to bring you down. And then he was a man that was very carefree. He was a playboy. He loved ease and he loved pleasure. And the Bible says, woe to them that are at ease. We in America are at ease in comparison to the rest of the world. And so Belshazzar had just won some military victories. And his father, who was a great general, was out on the frontiers leading them from victory to victory. And so he decided that he wanted to celebrate. And he decided to have a great feast. And it would be the greatest feast that Babylon had ever seen. Babylon with all of its glamour. Babylon with all of its wealth. Babylon with all that it had. He said, we'll have the greatest feast in the history of the world. So he ordered the finest dances, the finest wines, the best foods. And he sent an invitation to a thousand of his lords and ladies throughout the empire to come. And in their jewel chariots, they came. And that evening, as they were feasting and dancing and whining in the low-hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar had built for his Midian wife, one of the seven wonders of the world, Belshazzar became intoxicated. There he was, king of an empire, master of a banquet, the center of all attention, dancing the night away. But the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Belshazzar, watch out. Judgment is coming. You're going too far. There's a point beyond which the patience of God will not go. There's a line drawn among nations and among individuals and in families and in communities. Job said, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Keep on plowing your iniquity. Keep on sowing your wickedness. You're going to someday reap it. Hosea said, for they have sown to the wind and they shall reap a whirlwind. Jeremiah said, they've sown wheat, but they shall reap thorns. 
And so in the middle of this banquet, Belshazzar's dancing with a beautiful, sexy young girl. And all of a sudden, everyone is quiet. You can hear a pin drop. His face turns white. The Bible says he begins to tremble because over on the wall, an armless hand starts writing. And everyone sat there trembling, wondering what this was, what strange thing this was. And Belshazzar tried to read it. He couldn't read the message. So he said, let's call the astrologers and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans. Let's call the magicians. Let's call all the people that can read this type of thing. And they came in. They couldn't read it. Belshazzar was even more afraid. The writing was getting lighter all the time and more brilliant. People were frightened. And his mother heard about it. And his mother, incidentally, was not at the party. But she came in. And she said, son, what is this I hear about a strange writing? And he pointed over to the wall. She said, I know a man that can read that writing. His name is Daniel. He's a great prophet. He helped your grandfather interpret dreams. He was prime minister under your grandfather. He's been living in sort of semi-retirement. Perhaps you don't know him. Daniel was not at the party. But they sent for him. And he came in, and Belshazzar said, Daniel, you see that writing? If you'll read that writing, I'll make you the third ruler in the empire. I'll put a gold chain of authority around your neck, and I'll put royal robes on you, and you'll be a member of the royal family next to me. Daniel looked at the writing, and he recognized it immediately. That was his father's handwriting. That was God the Father's handwriting and he had studied God and lived with God all these years and he knew that that was God's writing. He said, Belshazzar, I can read the writing, but keep your gifts. I don't want them. Give your gifts to somebody else. You see, Belshazzar, O king, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of God's holy house before thee, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and God is offended. And thou hast praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone that see not and hear not and know not. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. Yes, Belshazzar, I'll read it. God had given Belshazzar everything he had, even the ability to laugh. His food, his drink, his power, his riches, everything had come from God, but he hadn't thanked the Lord for it. Daniel said, all right, here's the writing. Meanie, meanie, tekel, you farson. This is the interpretation. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Belshazzar, you're finished. Your last day has been spent on this earth. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances of God and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And while they were in the banquet unknown, unknown to the Babylonians. The great Euphrates River was being changed in its course and the Medo-Persian army slipped under on the dry riverbed. And that night, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar was killed. Daniel remained and became prime minister in the next empire. Both empires respected him for his wisdom and his faith and his purpose and his godliness. Is God writing on the wall of America tonight? The word many also re means remembered. God remembers. 
God remembers our sins. God sees our pornography. He sees our obscene films, and he sees these new films that are coming out making fun of Jesus Christ. He sees our lying and our cheating and our corruption that goes all the way through our society. He sees it all, and the Scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. But he remembers something else too. It's not too late. God remembers to forget. When any group of people, any nation, will repent of their sins and turn to the Lord, he'll forgive their sins and heal the land. That's the promise of the Lord. Secondly, he says, Thou art weighed in the balances and found one. The Scripture says, Thou dost weigh the paths of the just. The Lord says, By the Lord actions are weighed. All the ways of a man are clear in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. The nation, the world tonight is being weighed. You are being weighed in the balances of God. Our sins are great in the eyes of the Lord, and we are being weighed in His balances. And many thinking leaders believe that the handwriting is already on the wall and the judgment is already beginning to take place. But God weighs us as individuals. What's he going to weigh us by? What's on the other side of the scales? You see, here's the scales. Here's you, and here's what God weighs you by. First, he'll weigh you by the Ten Commandments. How do you stand up with the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not murder. All of these are taken in the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. If you've broken one commandment one time in your life, it's the same as breaking all of them. Well, you say, well, of course I've broken at least one or two of them. Well, then you're guilty of all. And that's the reason the Bible says we're all guilty. That's the reason Jesus said, you that are without sin, pick up the first stone and throw it at this woman taken in adultery. None of these religious leaders could do it because we all have sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and all are under the judgment of God. Then not only are we going to be weighed by the Ten Commandments, but we're going to be weighed by the law of love. Matthew 22, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, said Jesus, hang all the law and all the teaching of the prophets. It's all summed up in love. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? And do you love your neighbor? Now, your neighbor means anybody that's in need. Jesus taught that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Anyone who's in need, you love that neighbor as much as you love yourself. That's what Jesus said. We're going to be weighed by that law. Thirdly, we're going to be weighed by the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 89, For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Isaiah said, To whom will be likened me and make me evil or equal and compare me that they should be like me? God says, Be ye holy, for so I am holy. If you don't, now Jesus Christ was the only righteous and the only holy man that ever lived. We call some people in India holy men. But Jesus was the only truly holy man of history. And if we don't live like Jesus and live as good as Jesus is, then we come short of God's requirement. 
and God's expectation. Will you say, Billy, who in the world can live like Jesus? Nobody. That's the reason you all have to say, I'm a sinner. God is going to weigh us by Christ. He's going to weigh us by the Ten Commandments. He's going to weigh us by the law of love. But he's also going to weigh you by your works. Those sins of omission that you weren't even conscious of. In Matthew 25, Jesus reminds us, For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you never came and visited me. But the people will say, Lord, where, we, where did we see you naked and sick and in prison and thirsty? Then he answered them this way, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now that strikes every person in this arena. And we come short. And then Jesus pronounced judgment. He said, those that are guilty of the sin of omission and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. You say, well, Billy, I'm sort of devastated. How can any of us weigh up? We can't. Jesus said in Revelation 3, I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, he said. Listen, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to miss heaven that you think are going to be there. And then fifthly, he's going to weigh us by our opportunities. By our opportunities. To whom much is given, much shall be required, he said. Think of living in America with all of its advantages. A church on almost every corner, a Bible in almost every hotel room, millions of Bibles available, the gospel by radio and television. Think of living here. He's going to judge us by the opportunities we had. Think of the Christian literature that's available at bookstores. And we don't take advantage of it. To whom much is given, much is required. You say, well, Billy, even on that score, I, <laughs> I can't make it. No. But the glory of this whole thing is that there is a gospel and the gospel is good news to people like you who are sitting there saying, well, I'm guilty. The good news is that God sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross to die for you. And God took those sins of yours and those failures of yours and laid them on Christ. He became sin for us. Now he said, the just and the righteous are going to get to heaven. How am I going to get a justness and a righteousness of my own when I don't have any? I'm a sinner. I don't weigh enough to get to heaven. But on the cross, Christ provided a justness for me. He provided a righteousness for me that I didn't have. And I am acceptable tonight by God, not because I've been good or because I've read the Bible or because I've preached to crowds of people. I'm acceptable because of Christ. I'm accepted into the beloved because of him. And that's your privilege at this moment. You can appropriate what Christ did on the cross to you right now, and you can leave here weighing enough to get to heaven, weighing enough to have your sins forgiven, weighing enough to live a new life. Thou art weighed in the balances of God and found warning. Are you found warning? The last word here is you, Parson, divided. Thy kingdom is divided. 
God said, Belshazzar, I'm taking your kingdom away from you. You're finished. Judgment has come. It's too late. Is God going to say that to you? Judgment has come. It's too late. I know people that know that and accept that and believe that and just go on merrily dancing their way to hell. They're like the mouse that's been caught in the trap that's still nibbling at the cheese after being caught. You're still nibbling at the devil's bait and you're already dead as far as eternity is concerned. I believe this crusade has been held at the right time and in the providence of God at the right moment in the history of many of your lives. People have prayed for you. People have worked. People have given to make this possible. And now this is your moment with God to receive him into your heart, to make sure that you weigh enough. No, I won't be at the judgment. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. I won't see you there. The judgment that I deserved was taken by Jesus Christ at the cross. And I accepted what he did, even though it looked foolish and looked a little bit ridiculous, for me to come forward that night and say yes to Jesus Christ in front of all those people. I did it. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to get up out of your seat and come forward and stand in front of this platform and say, by coming, I want Christ in my heart. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. But don't you let this afternoon pass until you've said yes to Jesus Christ. Because you see, you may never have another moment like this. This may be the last moment that you'll ever have. And now is the moment you get up and come. With hundreds of people that have come this past week, even thousands, you come and join them and say today, I want Christ to forgive my sins. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to weigh enough when I have to be weighed in the great scales of God at the great judgment. If you come from that top gallery up there, it'll take you a couple minutes to come. So come right now, quickly, from everywhere. Hundreds of you. God is speaking to you. You may be in the choir. You may be an usher. Whoever you are, you get up and come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. As you can see on television, hundreds of people are coming here in St. Louis to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. They want to be sure that their sins are forgiven. They want to know that they weigh enough in the scales of God. No, I don't believe it's too late for America to turn to God. I believe we could have healing in our country. I believe we could turn to God and find a whole new atmosphere if we did turn to him. But that can also happen in your life as an individual and it can happen in your home and it ha can happen in your block and in your community, in your apartment, in wherever you are. But it must start with somebody. It could start with you. If you will say yes to Jesus Christ right now. I hope you make that commitment. God help you to make it. And be sure and go to a church next Sunday. Good evening and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you.
If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free. So come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. To you that are watching by television, this great stadium here at uh, San Jose University in the southern area of San Francisco Bay in San Jose, is filled to overflowing. There are a few empty seats here and there, but if you took the people on the ground that are sitting all over the ground, it'd more than fill uh, this uh, great stadium where the Spartans play. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. To Joshua, the 24th chapter. Now, you that are watching on television are going to see a telephone number across the screen you call. Any time during this program or after the program and their counsel is standing by to talk with you about your spiritual problems and your spiritual needs. And so pick up the phone and call. If you call and it's busy, call again. Now the 24th chapter of Joshua. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us. Or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God to follow him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying separated by many years and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again and that's why the gospel never grows old it applies to every generation alike we have to make a choice 
Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time. And still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six. And Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them. And how they had won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure. The gods of lust and greed and hate. The gods of materialism. Even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you. Because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. 
You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now, at conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or 10 years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life, you practice sin. You're born towards sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices like the rich young ruler. Remember he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said sir what must I do to find eternal life and Jesus said looked at him and loved him and said go sell all that you have give it to the poor take up the cross follow me the young man was grieved he wept he wanted Christ but he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want, I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if JR is gonna be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now, the cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it, you've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. 
And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better. But they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers. Two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8, a very shocking statement. The 44th verse. He said, you are of your father, the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it. But that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there's the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching. And call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now. Waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. 
Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences. And there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation. This faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafla is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When he died on that cross, he forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification, just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love him and I'm going to love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I'm going to make him the priority of my life. I'm going to put him first from now on. He's going to be not only my savior, but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be an officer in the church but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure and you must be willing to repent and secondly by faith receive Christ into your heart that means you put your whole weight on him and trust him and him alone and thirdly you follow and serve him as his disciple and follower and obey him that means a big change for many of you if you make this choice I'm going to ask you to make it now and I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen 
thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes, so start now. And come and stand in front of this platform, and as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. And you that have been watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number. There are people standing by to talk to you right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in this stadium at San Jose University in California that hundreds of people are coming to make their commitment to Christ. Pick up the phone. You see on your screen, you dial that number and if you don't get in right away, keep calling. They'll be there all evening and make your commitment to Christ over the telephone or ask the counselor to ask, answer your questions. God help you to make that commitment. And please go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can